But I do, I do hope that everyone's had a different Not working. Call the meeting to order. And then Derek, are you introducing? Yeah, uh, Amy, do you wanna go through roll first and then I can do the introductions? Okay, you wanna do that? Okay, so we'll call this meeting to order of the Moorhead Economic Development Authority. Today is March 7th, 2022 at 11.45 p.m. We are meeting in the Yumcom Center Auditorium. Members present today include Laura Caroon, Alex Cusa, James Hand, Mike Leeser, Bobby Solin, and Deb White. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. <laughs> All right, now we have um, introductions. Yeah, Derek? we um, we obviously just uh, we have a new member here today. I don't know if my, is my mic on? Can you hear me? All right, it's a little, it's a little quiet. Yeah, um, I don't know if we can change that from the back or not, but. Uh, uh, Mike Leeser is here with us today as a new member of the EDA appointment um, from Mayor Carlson, who's joining us today as well. But um, Mike, we thought if you if you don't mind, maybe just give a little introduction about yourself, what you do, and and uh, why you were encouraged to join the the EDA. There you go. Now we're good? Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you everybody. Uh, it's an honor really to be here with you all today. I, uh, I'm Mike Leeser. I'm from Moorhead, graduated from Moorhead Senior High School. Uh, classmate of Mr. Coda's over there uh, at the other side of the tables here. I'm an assistant county attorney here at the Clay County Attorney's Office just down the road. I've been there for about eight years. I was in private practice a little bit before that as a uh, Part of those duties, I was an assistant city attorney down in Wapiton, North Dakota, and I met with some of their boards that are the similar boards like this. And uh, I'm just a Moorhead guy. I'd love to see Moorhead flourish and to uh, see opportunities for people to come here and make this their home. And uh, I think this would be a great way for me to just serve my community and, and work with all you fine people. So um, I'll probably lay back for a while to see how things go and, and where my voice is needed, but uh, uh, so don't take that as shy. If I have a strong opinion about something, I'll share it for you. But for a while, I, I want to learn the lay of the land and, and, and learn from everybody here. So um, again, it's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And uh, I think it's worth noting too, obviously with uh, our former chair, Michael Burns, um, who is, is on to doing other things. I know his work was, was taking some time uh, and, and he was getting very busy with that. So we wanna thank Mike for all of his service over the number of years and the last few years of, of being chair of the EDA, as well as Jeff Schaumann, who uh, um, uh, recently uh, has decided to kind of step away from the EDA as well. So we wanna thank both Mike and, uh, and Jeff for their service to the EDA as well. So back to you, Madam Chair. All right, um, now we have the uh, agenda men amendments and there are none. Uh, the minutes from January 3rd, we need to approve those. Anybody have any changes to the minutes? Um, then if you approve the minutes, uh, say aye. I think you need to, I'll move, mo Madam move, Chair, oh, yeah, I move to approve. Go, second. Thank you. All in favor? I think James second. Aye. Yep. Aye. 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 Motion passed. And then citizens addressing the board, we have Sherry from the MBA. I'll take it. Uh, James is doing it. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, with the uh, Moorhead Business Association update, we'll start with Let's Talk Business. MBA members meet every Wednesday at the Moorhead American Legion at noon. Uh, make sure you get there early to order lunch from Jay's Smoke and Barbecue. This week we have Megan Kruger, the Executive Director of the Moorhead Public Library, and uh, she'll be sharing their story this week. So we're excited for that. The uh, Moorhead Alliance of Nonprofits meets the last Monday of each month. Connie Bislex with Thrivent shared their story on February 28th and how Thrivent members can benefit their charities. Uh, thank you to the many businesses who give back to the community and especially our nonprofits. Be sure to follow the Moorhead Alliance of Nonprofits Facebook page. Uh, Frostival 2022 review. 
Uh, thanks to our title sponsor, Puzzle Escape Rooms, for helping us continue the annual snow sculpture competition. This year we had five teams with competing sculptures. Congratulations to Jay Ray and his creation of the Dancing Dragons, which took first place. Thank you to the many businesses who sponsored the annual event. Moorhead held more than 24 Frostival events this year, and we'd like to thank the Moorhead Parks and Recreation, the City of Moorhead, CVB, Heralds on Main, Veterans Honor Flight, Moorhead Police Athletics and Activities League, the Lotus Center, FM Legion Riders, Derby for the Vets, Nature for the North, the Bottle Shop, Sunset Lanes, American, uh, Moorhead American Legion, TAC Music Venue, Scott Tolbalt Foundation, Coley Hockey Center, and others for making this year's event a success. It, uh, it takes a village. Uh, thousands from the community were able to embrace the cool of winter, and it was another fantastic year for Frostful, even though it was particularly cold this year. <laughs> Uh, join us for upcoming NBA events. Uh, we have the NBA Indoor Three-Person Golf Scramble at Clubhouse Indoor Golf Lounge on March 15th. We still have open tee times at 9 and 11 a.m. Uh, this year we have the annual Party Golf Tournament at the Meadows Golf Course on May 26th. Last year the event sold out and we have 12 spots left and uh, some whole sponsorships are available as well. So if you want to be involved, get signed up. The Moorhead Proud 5656 ooh and ah fireworks are uh, coming up this July. Drive up and tune into Bob 95 to celebrate the 49th year of this tradition at Horizon Shores Park. Uh, thank you to Radio FM Media and BNSF for your support again this year. And finally, uh, the NBA is hiring. We're looking for an individual to work closely with our fantastic executive director, Sherry Larson. If interested, please send her your resume. Uh, her email address is sherry at mhdmba.org. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, now we have the commissioner's reports. None? No? Okay. Election of officers, which we've all been looking forward to. Amy's going to explain what's required for each office, or Derek is going to explain what's required for each office. I will try my best, so thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's that time of year when we're looking at the election of officers, as we just mentioned, uh, Michael Burns um, moving on, who has been our past chair for, for a couple of years now. Um, Bobby obviously is, is gratefully uh, um, chairing our meeting today. Nate Anderson, who is our vice chair, uh, was not able to make it today. Um, we do need a, a chair, a, a vice chair and a secretary. Bobby is, uh, um, has been asked and, and is willing to still serve as the secretary to the EDA. Uh, so that being said, we're looking for a vice chair and a chair to um, the EDA right now. I have had a conversation with Nate Anderson. He is willing to step up into that chair position if um, you know if called upon. Um, obviously, if there's others that are interested or or others that are willing to at least um, help out in that uh, vice chair position, we'd we'd love to have that conversation today and see if we can get those um, those duties filled for for kind of this meeting here. Uh, beyond that, uh, I should have mentioned as well that. Uh, we are still uh, seeking a couple more appointments. Uh, I think one from, from the mayor's side of it and uh, the other from Ward 4. So we're expecting those over the next uh, few weeks here. So hopefully we'll have a few more folks joining us. Um, the subcommittees of the EDA, specifically the Moorhead Loan Fund, there is a vacancy on that, but that is uh, uh, a Ward 4 spot. So we'll, we'll have to um, kind of have that uh, fill in once there's the appointment. The other is the Makara Development Control Board, the Makara Review Board. Um, there is a, a current vacancy from the EDA. We have three, three seats available from the EDA to be on that. James Han, Nate Anderson uh, have been serving in that capacity and we are looking for one more uh, to fill that spot. I should note for both the Moorhead Loan Fund and the Makara Review, um, we just meet as needed. Um, Makara in particular, we're, we're really looking to kind of move away to have more of a privately held association from the owners in Makara rather than having uh, the EDA kind of um, fill in and lead that kind of role. So we've been working with our city attorney on, on that process. It just takes quite a bit of time to transfer uh, that authority. Um, so in the meantime, we'd be looking for somebody to serve in that capacity. So to summarize, 
we are looking for um, uh, action today on, on kind of these election of officers. The secretary position, as I mentioned, Bobby is interested uh, and still serving in that capacity. Vice chair, which is as of right now, uh, uh, an open seat if, um, uh, if we do elect Nate Anderson as chair and, uh, and be looking for an appointment uh, to the McCarr Review Board as well. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or um, we can take some time to think about it. I don't know if anybody has any immediate interest to, to bring forward to the group or not. So would this be an appropriate time to make nominations? Yes. I'd like to nominate Nate Anderson as chair. Have another, or do we just keep throwing out nominations or you, make a nomination and vote or? I'm, I think what we could do, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, is you could, if we have a slate of individuals to kind of go in these roles, we could do it in one action. Uh, you could open it up for discussion if somebody feels differently about a, uh, about a position as well. So I'd also like to nominate Bobby as secretary. James? Deb? I don't know if he'll accept it, but I'd like to nominate Alex Cusa for vice chair. Tell you now if he accepts it. I, and I look at Amy too. I mean, we can make the, the action here today. If, if Alex, if you need time to think about it too, we can always uh, solidify that position at the next meeting as well for vice chair. So um, we can talk through schedules and everything else too. Um, is there any interest for the Makara Review Board? I'd be interested in that. Okay. So I think if we want to take action here today, we could do um, Nate Anderson as chair, Bobby as secretary, and Bobby as well for the vacant seat on the Makara Review Board. Do we need to do discussion on that? You can open it up to discussion if there's any comments. Any other nominations? If I could, um, so James made the motion, we probably need a second, and then maybe opened up for discussion. Second. Should, so I don't, I've nominated two, but should we make a motion for the two positions and Makara? So in one, so I'll make a motion to elect Nate Anderson as chair, Bobby, Celine, right, sorry, <laughs> Celine as secretary, and um, Bobby as well on appointed to Makara. Second. I'll take Thanks, it. Deb. Any discussion? All in favor of it, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passed. Thank aye. you all for your willingness to, to take those positions. We really appreciate it. And now we have the annual development report. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm obviously very grateful to have uh, City Manager Dan Molly and Mayor uh, Shelley Carlson here as well. So uh, this is as much as their report and, and certainly Laura and, and Deb as council members, uh, your reports as it is mine. And, and uh, before I get too far into it, um, city staff really are the ones behind creating this report. Kirstie Lashovsky and, and community development and a lot of her team mem members uh, really took the time to create a, I think really thoughtful and um, detailed report of, of celebrating the year of 2021 and, and what Moorhead has had going on in their, our great community. So uh, a, few, a few things that I wanna touch on, uh, and as I said, Mayor and Dan, please, please uh, interject if you have uh, things that you wanna focus on as well. Um, Amy, are you able to pull that up on the screen if you get a chance? There we go. Um, so I'll just kind of pop that up there. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in front of you as well. Um, it turn in here. We might just need to scroll here as we go. But um, so 2021, obviously, we were still feeling the impacts of COVID, right? We still had um, uh, plenty of, of disruptors to our business uh, community as well as our development community. But when you really look at the, the year holistically, I think it was a rebound real year for a lot of individuals and a lot of businesses. 
we saw uh, tremendous growth from our permit numbers uh, that you'll see on, on uh, kind of third page here. And a couple of the, the things worth noting when you look at this screen here, uh, just look at that annual building investment number from 2019 was about 78 million, 2020 was about 97 million, uh, 2021, 94, 194 million. Uh, that is significant, significant growth. Yes, there are a couple uh, one-time projects with the, the school district that make that number rise, um, but that only tells a minor piece of the story from the growth perspective. You know, our residential numbers, um, you know, again, looking from 2020 to 2021, 20, uh, we had uh, single family, both even, but the, the multifamily, and, and we've seen these, these new buildings go from, you know, 7 million to 23 million almost, uh, these new multifamily housing opportunities that people have, these are, are sometimes workforce uh, housing. Some have been low income, um, affordable housing projects, as well as a lot of market rate uh, projects as well. And we're seeing uh, these properties fill up on a continual basis as they come online. Uh, we are seeing those get occupied and, and we're seeing more, more individuals moving into our community from opportunities. I think in particularly from what we're hearing from some of the um, uh, larger scale developers, the enclaves and, and epics, when you look at their properties that they built specifically in downtown and what enclaves are already seen on the, on the south end of town by um, uh, the south side of 8th and 94, is you're seeing these uh, housing opportunities for students. You know, students that, that um, traditionally would have been maybe living in, in smaller homes, rental homes on campus, thanks Amy, um, now have I think viable and, and quality housing opportunities for them in these, these uh, larger buildings. And we might now see the ability to, to transition some of those homes that have been pri primarily rentals to uh, other programs that we've talked about with uh, rehabilitation and restoration to uh, see those transitioned into affordable single family homes again as well. So we're excited for, for what that future can hold. Um, now again, the commercial permit uh, values, uh, again, 2020 to, to 2021, uh, new commercial projects, 24 million to over 34 million, the commercial remodel from 32 to 103 million. Again, significant, significant growth in our uh, in our region here and, and specifically in Moorhead. So we're, we're proud to see those numbers climb and, and continue to climb as well. Um, hey Derek, could, could if I could? Yes, please. One, I gotta lean back a little bit. Can you go back one? Yep. So the word that we've been using is, is that, does that go back a slide? Oh, okay, great. Is um, accelerating. So you could see, and the reason is, is because like say on your speedometer, speedometer, you see it kind of like growing. So what's nice here is that over the last three years, we are able to say that we are accelerating um, by the nature of new permits growing in value from 2019, say with commercial 11 and a half to 24 and a half in 2020 to 34.2 in 2021. So that's the, the growth progression that we're looking for. And then uh, the renovations where you go from 26 million to 32 million to 103, I mean, that's just absolutely incredible. So let's keep going. And we see that growth in residential as well. That's really super to see on a data basis. Derek, can I ask you a question on the on the numbers? Is this so on there the commercial permit values and you've got the 103 million in commercial remodel? Is that is is that where the high school permit lies and is that the full value of the the, the high school permit? It's not the whole. It doesn't encompass the entire uh, capture of that high school project, but it is a part of that number. Correct. But now, so that would represent the amount of the school that was constructed in 21, basically that calculated value? Yep. Okay, so I mean, there's still a lot of dollars there outside of the school then, so that is pretty yes. impressive. Yeah, significant. I, I haven't had it broken down uh, particularly, but we're far surpassed the 32 million that was done in 2020. Are there any other particularly large projects that cont that contributed to that, or just a, just a big number of uh, variety of size and scale? You're going to be getting into that. That's the next slide on the report. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. To, there's a lot in this, so hopefully we can kind of leave some time for for some questions too. But feel feel free to stop me uh, as well. You know, I. I 
I w I'm not going to um, dive into a lot of the residential, although I'll just say there's there's a lot happening on that front as well. Um, we're going to continue to see some growth there, I think, through uh, the resilience that we're showing within our community as well as um, some of these, these amenities that are being built as well as the mayor will get into with the Regional Library Community Center conversation as well. You can just see even, even on the report, uh, this is all online on the city of Moorhead, just some of the single family and multifamily projects that are coming online as well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll touch briefly on it, but the affordable housing side of it, I, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, obviously the, the Emory apartments that Enclave's doing, um, we have silver lining apartments that are, that are coming on for 55 plus, um, we got a number of projects that are, that are gonna kind of overall um, go towards the mission of, of kind of creating an affordable community. We'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later when we start talking about our economic incentive review and a task force that we're, we're hoping to kind of create. But, you know, a lot of these projects that are going on, if they're not specifically uh, getting state tax credits or, or some type of tax credit uh, or being able to, to get some relief through tax increment financing through a housing TIF district, a lot of these projects um, don't really happen, quite frankly. So we'll have to get creative if that's a priority of our council and, and something that we want to look into of just what kind of tools and creativity you want to have to um, to provide these opportunities for folks as well. Um, as I mentioned, here's just again some single family, multifamily uh, housing incentives and, and um, stuff that's available for folks as well. You know, and there's a neighborhood section here too. I'll specifically hit on a couple things with our downtown. Obviously in 2018, we, we established our uh, housing goal of 500 housing units over the next five years. Our number is about 256 housing units um, and we're expecting more. Um, we got some, some projects on the horizon. Uh, specifically, I think uh, the Bowleg one uh, that Epic is going to do, I don't think that's going to break ground this spring, but more than likely we'll see some movement with, uh, with pilings in the fall. Uh, and then Kevin Bartram doing the Fairmont Creamery project uh, on the north side of First Avenue North, and I think that will be a really great project for, for our community as well to see some historic renovation as well as some new construction too. Um, we got storefront rehab program that we've seen people take advantage of. Um, you know, we still have up here the Opportunity Zone. That's a federal program that happened a, a number of years ago. Um, one thing, though, that we're seeing across the nation, quite frankly, is that had a ticking time on that from when it was established. So we're seeing less benefit for some developers to uh, to take advantage of that. So we're, we're again having to use creative alternatives with uh, what we have, whether that's through TIF or the Renaissance Zone, to uh, suffice some of that opportunity as well. And I think we're really just building off of that downtown master plan we did in, in 2020 and, and hoping to kind of get more off of the, the city uh, onward Moorhead city comprehensive plan as well. Uh, commercial industrial. So again, this is where again, a lot of that growth, growth lies. Um, you know, some of the tools that we have, quite frankly, is our commercial industrial property tax exemption. This is unique, I think, to Moorhead, quite frankly, across the board. But we have that between uh, three and five year incentive term for an exemption on new value that's created. So we've seen a lot of expansions. We've seen some new builds take advantage of this, but we've also been able to support a lot of um, business expansion within our community, which I think really makes a, a, you know, a growing community and a viable community when you provide opportunities for, for our folks within that have made that initial investment. Uh, give them that opportunity to, to grow and, uh, and be successful. Um, again, some of the list of, of businesses that uh, we're seeing take advantage of, of these projects. Um, again, in downtown, the Van A project, they'll see their uh, final tenant go in here within the next couple months. Uh, and they've also gotten some interest from a, a coffee shop uh, kind of small hut coffee shop that they're going to work with planning on uh, to see if they can fit something like that on the site as well. So I think some unique de developments there. Um, 12th and Main, some housing projects, Block 37. Uh, and then our two event centers that came online, the River Haven um, and the Armory Event Center, which I think have been great additions to our downtown as well. Uh, then across the, the community with our commercial industrial incentives, American Crystal Sugar, uh, made a large investment on the North Campus uh, up by the Country Club there. 
uh, cash concrete, a uh, couple car washes. We've had DS Beverage do a large expansion to, to continue growth there. First International Bank and Trust did a, a brand new uh, bank that's under construction by the, the South Hornbachers, which I think will be the first of many projects that that corridor will see over the next uh, couple years as well. We saw Dwayne's um, uh, Pizza close in their traditional form, but Midtown Tavern kind of take that over, and we'll be seeing that open up here in the next uh, uh, couple months as well. Southmore Plaza, uh, new Starbucks on East 10, and then um, we've seen this continual growth in this um, this this um, uh, storage kind of warehousing, these, these shop condos that these small businesses are being able to operate their businesses out of as well. Again, the institutional side of things, as we as we touched on, I won't get into too much depth of this, but certainly the um, career academy and the high school projects are large projects that are are really making a big difference. I think for um, being a, an amenity and something that's going to drive uh, folks to really really be a part of this community and the growth. I think when we look at when we look at uh, communities across the board, so many of so many of the kind of I would say the amenities or the, the opportunities exist with providing for youth. Um, school systems and quality school systems is one of that and we're excited to see some pretty large projects that are going to create opportunities uh, uh, for years to come. You know, our border city stuff, uh, we've had really good outcomes with uh, Lisa Bodie and, and the mayor and Dan and, and many others uh, that are working on the legislative priority stuff. Uh, the mayor will touch on the, the regional library community center here in just a little bit. Uh, I think there's still opportunities to discuss what we have from a border city's uh, community perspective. The disparity reduction credit, our commercial industrial property tax being the same uh, as North Dakota is still something that is, I don't want to say is unknown, but it's not known enough. Um, we need to continue to tell that story as, as businesses are making decisions in our community and especially as we're seeing a shortage in commercial, well, I'll say industrial spaces available on the North Dakota the side of the river. We have city land um, ready to go and available. Um, we have folks from the Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC here as well with our Shovel Ready program as the, the highest certified site that they have in their platinum um, kind of system. And so we're, we're excited to maybe see some progress and growth within uh, the industrial boundaries as well. You know, and I think too, just with the studies that are going underway, we got a lot happening, whether it's um, the, the city comprehensive plan, uh, we have the 11th Street underpass that has the, the visual quality design kind of manual that's, that's a part of it. We got Metro Cog doing a, a bike plan, a, a housing study. Um, we have our mall master plan that's uh, in the process as well. So there's just a lot of things happening. And we thank the community for being as gauged as they are to, to really just lead us in the direction that we need to go as, as community leaders and, and staff to make sure that we're building what the community uh, desires and, and really wants. So um, again, some things to really look forward to, and I'll mention this in my economic development report, but the Days In project, I think that's such a, a unique one and a big one for our community to see some, some changes there. Uh, I mentioned briefly to the Moorhead Center Mall project that I think is just really going to see more things come out within the next couple months. Um, and then our, our limited stock of truly historic buildings getting a facelift by Kevin Bartram and his team I think is just is just a really quality thing. Um, you know, legislative priorities. I don't know, Dan, do you want to give any updates on the legislative side? I know you, you and the mayor and others were just down in St. Paul. Happy to. We were down in St. Paul last week. We had a great visit uh, for Legislative Action Day. We talked um, mainly about our um, bonding priority, which is we've got about 17 million in in-town flood protection left to do. We're in the governor's budget at two separate points, so that was really super. We had some great conversations along that. We got some updates on local government aid and some of the proposed changes and the impacts to local government in that way. And then, uh, of course, this border city uh, disparity work is constantly on the front of our agenda. Uh, we have a legislative work group made up of 
um, Mayor Carlson, uh, Council Member Hendrickson, and Council Member White. So uh, our Governmental Affairs Director, Lisa Bodie, the Mayor, uh, Deb White, Chuck and I were down there, and uh, it was really a knockout trip. So um, I have to say our legislative de delegation treated us so well. It was like they were waiting to serve us when we got down there. Couldn't have felt more welcomed, and uh, the sense of possibility was, was really great as we left. So thank you, Derek. Thank you, Dan, and the mayor, and Lisa, and and all those that work on that legislative front. It's uh, it's certainly a big task, and and we appreciate all their time and efforts into it. Uh, really, the last thing I was going to touch on was just the community amenities, and and there is a slide on there as well. But uh, the river corridor trail expansion, really trying to connect um, trails from north to south, and really making sure that we're uh, uh, providing that amenity that I think is very unique to our area. Um, and then the community fund with uh, the inclusive playground, the natural playground going on the north side of, of the Moorhead Center Mall site. Uh, and then lastly, again, the regional library and community center as well. So just some, some really great projects, some really uh, wonderful things that are happening this year. I think looking back, even when I started in 2018, Dan started in 2018, you, you look, look at some of these reports and yes, there were things to celebrate, but. It, I think we're getting more and more context getting squeezed into these uh, reports. So it's just, uh, it's really great to see and, and just thankful for all the people that work so hard to make this community a great place to be. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any comments, questions from the EDA. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, first of all, I just want to say how exciting it was to read this, even though you know we're hearing about these things piecemeal, but just to see it all in one is really impactful. And, and you know, uh, when our city manager talked about that accelerated growth, you really can see that. And if we're just looking at even over the last three years, and it it makes me even more excited for what's to come. And the fact that we did that during a time of such instability, you know, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and all of this is is really just a testament to how things are growing in, in Moorhead. Um, there's one thing I wanted to highlight, and I wondered, I think it's on slide seven. It's the one, I wanted to go back to this because I think it's a good point. Under the housing market, the, it's the median sale price. I think it might be seven. Let's see. Yeah, so I was really excited to see this because I think, you know, you hear anecdotally people saying how you can get more house for your dollar in Moorhead. And I think this really is a testament. I was surprised just how big of a difference it was. You know, you look at this, that the average home price in Moorhead, the median was $229.9. Um, and then you go uh, up to 250000 for Fargo. And then 292.5 for West Fargo. I mean, that's a huge difference. And for so many families, you know, when they're looking at where they want to make their home and where they can afford to, to get a good home, I mean, it just really is a testament that even though housing prices have gone up, we're still very, very affordable. And so again, I think, you know, it really adds to that anecdotal evidence that we have. And so I was really happy to see that and, and um, just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that as well. If I can add to it, I would just say too, and I think it also stresses the importance of, we didn't touch on it today, but I know we've, we've brought this forward to the EDA other times of, of building our commercial industrial tax base. Um, you know, we, we lost so much in the, in the mid 80s. Um, we're, we're definitely probably half of where we should be to a size uh, community that we are from our commercial industrial base. We should be really be up towards that 30, 33%, or about 15, 16%. Um, to make sure that we're continuing to provide those affordable opportunities, uh, we got to build our business base up. And that's why I think we've been as aggressive as we have been, but there's still a lot more to do on that front as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'll, I'll maybe just add one last thing if I can, Dan. So. Um, Again, I really appreciate everybody's time and energy to, to really, I mean, you're a part of this. Um, as EDA members, you really are a part of this and building that foundation. We're hearing more and more from the development community and the business community. And I'll just say, I think even residentially from people that live across this region of um, what, you know, what's happening to Moorhead or we're seeing the change. Uh, we're hearing it from media now too. We're getting the phone calls from media members saying that they just honestly haven't done a good enough job telling the story of Moorhead. So I think, um, I think we're gonna see more opportunities to celebrate and, and share our story. This report is just one of many ways to do it. Um, and I know there was a push after we had a chance to talk to council and talk to EDA 
of really getting this out the door and, and, and sharing this document in a, in a bigger way so people really understand what's happening here too. So again, thank you for, for all you're doing. Dan, I think you may have a comment here too. Certainly, yeah, if you don't mind. So a couple real quick things. I wanted to say that, um, you know, about a year ago we uh, kind of initiated uh, a greater level of communication so that we could tell that story. So I just wanted to say thank you all for supporting that work. Uh, we hired a communication coordinator, Mark Dickerson, who's working in our governmental affairs office to help us do that. It's so phenomenally important that we have these conversations. And so uh, I think that, um, gosh, who was it, Maya Angelou, when she talks about it's not what you do, it's how people feel. That's where we're really kind of focused, <laughs> if I'm being honest. And so when we sit down and we talk with the development community, our community development director, Chrissy Leshevsky, it's funny, um, she doesn't wait for folks to call her. She calls them to check in on how things are going, which is really incredible uh, that she would do that. And. Um, uh, I just want you to know that our, our philosophy is really seeking alternatives as opposed to obstacles, and we're hearing that from our development partners, and uh, that's just wonderful to hear. We've asked why, um, why, why this interest, because we've got kind of larger developers, we've got this interest going on, so what's fueling that? We were hoping to create that sense of competition. What we've been hearing is, one is we're, it's, it's clear that we're trying to be more uh, permission giving than permission giving. <laughs> Uh, there's that one. The other one is that, um, and this may speak to what the mayor is talking about, it's clear that we're investing, that the community, the public's investing in Moorhead too. We've got skin in the game. We're seeing that with Center Avenue, which we're calling Center Stage, and some of the improvements. We've got this natural playground that's gonna be going this spring. We're really making strides on the inclusive playground. We're, so, so the engagement on this level is just really incredible that we're doing that. And then the properties are being, um, who was it, Kevin Bartram, that had told us, he said, you know, when I build, whether it's residential or commercial, it's getting leased up. So, you know, it's not, it's, it, it's making economic sense, too. So that part of telling our story is just so important. And uh, to that, that's all of us, you know, sitting together, working, communicating on common goals, and then going and leading from where we sit and sharing that. So thank you for your part. Wait. Thank you, Derek and Dan. And now we'll move on to the report by Mayor Carlson. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the EDA, um, City Manager Molly, Derek LaPointe, Amy Thorpe. Um, just thank you all for serving. I know that it takes time away from uh, your day jobs. Um, I have a day job as well, so I know Balancing everything um, can be a challenge sometimes, but it's very important. And uh, I really appreciate those of you who step up to serve your community. Um, as Bobby said, my as the chair said, uh, my name is Shelley Carlson, I'm Mayor of Moorhead, and I'm very excited to come and give you uh, an update on the local option sales tax for the local um, po possible regional library and community center. Um, a little bit of background. How this works um, in the state of Minnesota currently, and so you might talk to somebody who five, 10 years ago um, to do a local option, local option sales tax, the, the steps to get to it, to get it to a vote was different. Um, our legislator, legislature changes it a little bit um, every few years because they like to keep us guessing. But for us, how it worked is we first had to go to the legislature to ask permission to bring it to our council and then from council to bring it to our voters. So last spring, so this has been a project that we have been working on for over a year. So last um, legislative session in 2021, we went and testified uh, via Zoom to our legislature to get the permission to bring it to the city council. And um, after we got permission from the legislature, I then appointed a mayor's citizen task force to work on what the regional library community center might encompass. Um, we needed to have a few questions answered prior to bringing it to the, the city council. Um, the individuals who are part of that mayor's task force is in your packet, so I won't go through them all, um, but I tried to make sure that they were from all parts of Moorhead, um, all business sectors, both um, for-profit and non-profit, um, and really looked at what the diversity would be on, so we had a lot of um, people's voices and the different lenses that our citizens look through for the Regional Library Community Center. The primary focus um, initially of that 
uh, Citizens Task Force was to really look at um, some possibilities of what the regional community center library could encompass, what, what we could possibly put in there. Um, those decisions are not finite. Those are just some ideas that were gathered. But then also to look at, and through a kind of a rubric system, of where the, the location of the regional community center library might be. Um, looking primarily at areas that were owned by the city of Moorhead because it didn't make uh, fiscal sense to purchase land to put something on when we already had land throughout the city. So we looked at areas in the north part of Moorhead, the, the middle downtown area part of Moorhead, and the south part of Moorhead. Um, and we also utilized a needs assessment that was done by the library because the individuals that are utilizing, in particular the library, but I also like to say the library is a community center, um, we had to look at what are the, the kind of the priorities of the individuals who utilize that facility within the, the um, city of Moorhead. Um, so some of those things that we looked at was, um, you know, is it close to public transportation? Is it close to other amenities? Um, and there were some other, not finding my notes here, where all the other different things that we looked at, and perhaps, James, you might be able to um, input, but there were a lot of uh, things that we looked at for that. Um, access to green space um, was one of the things that we looked at as well. Um, and so what the task force did is it kind of used a rubric system, figured it out, and there was one that really rose to the top of where would be um, an ideal location. Again, this is not set in stone, but this is what came from the citizens task force. And the most ideal location would be somewhere in the downtown area, particularly uh, along Center Avenue. Um, so that was what the citizens task force brought to the uh, city council on January 24th. And we received a unanimous vote of approval from the city council to put this on the November ballot. So that was really, really exciting. And so now we're ramping up the citizens task force because um, this is very um, led by citizens. And then we, um, as uh, the city, are supporting as far as providing the information. Um, and myself as mayor, I'm just trying to lead, lead this to getting a yes vote in November. Um, what we are going to be doing now uh, with the Citizens Task Force is dividing up into about four different subcommittees to create a process and really gather even more citizen input on what this proposed regional community library center would contain. Um, it's very important to note that it is a regional library. For those who are not aware, the Lake Agassiz Regional Library Center is comprised of a number of different libraries around um, within, I don't even recall, maybe Laura or James, you could tell me how many libraries are in. I think it's like seven different counties are part of the Lake Agassiz Regional Library Community or Library um, Center. Um, one of the things that the legislature requires is that it has to be together. So I've been asked, can you put the library in one spot and the community center in another, in another uh, location within the city? And we cannot do that. Um, we are required by the legislature to, number one, make sure that this library community center has a regional impact. And that was one of the reasons that we combined it with the libraries because they have a regional impact at their headquarters for Lake Agassiz Regional Libraries is in our Moorhead Library, which is the biggest site within their um, regional library center. Um, also, it's important to remember that the community center is, is a place where people gather and connect. Um, it's a place where new ideas and dreams can really make a change. And so that is one of the reasons why we really are wanting the citizens to engage and tell us what would this community center be. I know that there was something on the Moorhead Equals Fantastic website, and a lot of times we are being compared to the Rusted Center. One thing that is also important is to remember that this is not an athletic or aquatic center. Um, we're not, num number one, we're not gonna have the funding available to do that, and we're not gonna necessarily have the space available to do that. But that doesn't mean that we can't have an aquatic or um, an athletic center somewhere else in the, in the city of Moorhead. I don't think that we need to look at um, this with a scarcity lens. Moorhead doesn't just have to have one thing and then we're done. We can have multiple things. We do need to have a community center library. 
We also probably need to have some type of aquatic center and some type of athletic center. We can have all of these things in the city. We just have to figure out a way to come together, work together, um, and like city manager Molly said, by proving that we're gonna put a little bit of skin in the game, there are developers that would be interested in possibly partnering with us to do a public-private partnership. So we have to really focus just on the community library aspect. Once we get that yes vote, then there could be things that could be built on as part of it. One of those could be the Science Center, which is something that I also get asked a lot about, is that coming to Moorhead? I, will want, I want to put that on to the public and into the universe. I do want that here in Moorhead. I absolutely do. This is something that maybe could be attached to the community slash library, um, but it's not something for this focus that we can really determine yes or no. We have to really focus on just the community um, library center. So one of the things um, that I think is also important that we've been asked a lot about is how much of the local option sales tax would come from others outside of the city of Moorhead. And what the city did is we partnered with the University of Minnesota Extension Center for community vitality on a local sales tax impact analysis using 2019 data to estimate the contributions from Moorhead residents and visitors to that local option sales tax. And there were some really interesting findings that came out of this. Approximately 30% of the sales tax that's paid in the city of Moorhead comes from out of town visitors. So in other words, we would pay 70%, but 30% would be paid for people coming into our community. And I just was thinking as we're looking at the growth um, of businesses in the city of Moorhead, this was from 2019 data. As our businesses grow in the city, that is going to increase over the course of the next couple of years. So maybe it could be 35 or even 40% that are paid for by the um, from um, citizens outside or individuals outside of the city of Moorhead. To give you an idea, the city of Bloomington, their sales tax, about 75% come from out of town. But, you know, we don't have a Mall of America in Moorhead. Um, I don't think that we will ever get a Mall of America in Moorhead, but that would be great, you know, if we had 75% of it being paid for by others. Um, what this comes down to, to the, for the average Moorhead resident, is about a little over $2 a month is what your contribution would be to help fund this local, regional um, community and library center, or $25 a year um, in that sales tax. And it's important to know, too, that our sales tax is, um, we don't tax clothing, we don't tax food, um, automobiles wouldn't be taxed. We have a, no a number of exceptions for this in the state of Minnesota. Um, those are often things that, um, in Fargo, for instance, you do pay a sales tax on, on clothing items in particular. Um, so I think that that is also important to note. So what is going to happen between now and November 2022? So um, several important, important milestones that I want to uh, discuss. First of all, April 5th and April 19th, there are going to be two times, um, two dates, the 5th and the 19th, from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Moorhead Center Mall, where we are going to provide a short presentation, and then there's going to be different tables with information, and citizens will be able to come and provide the input into what they would like to see in this community center library. I think it's important to note that uh, a library is not about books. I think we even talked about in the mayor's task force that we should create a hashtag, not just books, because libraries are, like I said, places to connect and gather. They truly are community centers. And there are a lot of studies that bring up the fact that if you have a vibrant, bustling library that is utilized by the community, you have a vibrant community. Libraries provide equal access to everybody in the community, and when everybody in the community have equal access to information and activities and events that can create engagement and ways to connect with one another, the entire community rises, so nobody is kind of left behind. Um, we have uh, community meeting rooms in our current library, um, which is 60 years old, and sometimes the, the roof leaks and they have to move back the books. Um, so it's, it's not a great facility. The other thing is that I get asked a lot, what's going to happen to the old library? That's not something we're necessarily examining right now because we need to get a green light on November 1st. Um, with all of the economic development going in downtown, I don't anticipate that we would have any issue figuring out what to do with that space or that building. 
Um, quite frankly, the building maybe needs to be uh, looked at. It's one of our red rated facilities in the city of Moorhead, meaning that we would have to put in um, a significant amount of money to make it even okay. Um, because it, there's so much damage done in the last 60 years that it really needs a, probably just needs to be imploded. Um, anyway, so April 5th and 19th, they'll have an opportunity to provide citizens input. There are also going to be a few others that we just haven't solidified yet. Um, the task force will be also expanding, seeking new residents to be involved. So if you are a citizen who really, really feels strongly, um, please reach out to one of the task force members or myself and we will get you on one of the committees. Um, a lot more uh, broader community input sessions like the ones in April will be initiated. And then after that, project planning will be further developed, including a site, possible programming, size, and other details. So some of the programming that I have heard is a place for kids to go and, you know, like a climbing structure for kids to go in the wintertime, a walking track that is free that um, people can utilize in the winter months in particular. Perhaps a splash pad, so we might not be able to have a huge aquatic center, but maybe it's a splash pad. Maybe it's a teaching kitchen where somebody could rent out the kitchen to be able to um, have family baking parties or be able to teach how to bake certain things um, through our community education program. And again, if we have uh, another amenity like a, uh, a science museum that then is able to be attached to this regional library community center, those spaces would be able to be utilized by, the, by those other entities and other amenities as well. So we, we have to think um, only library community center, but also think and know that if we have that skin in the game, we'll be able to expand upon it. The election day um, is going to be November 8th, 2022, and hopefully that will be a resounding yes from our community. Um, to go ahead and then build this regional uh, library community center. Once um, we get the yes, I'm projecting positivity out into the universe, uh, then what would happen is then the city council um, would start pre-work on a municipal bond issuance and also put out bids for design and construction services. Um, then once those design and construct construction services bid um, comes back, then the city council would have to accept them and then select the design and construction services vendors. Then our task force would um, continue during this whole time also to be getting citizens engagement on the design and that site selection. The city sales tax wouldn't begin until the second quarter of 2023. So I think that's also important to note. Um, once the contractor secures the construction permits, then construction would bid. So this could be something that could potentially start um, in spring of 2023 or summer of 2023. So with that, um, there's a Q&A uh, sheet in your packet that also provides a lot of great um, answers to some questions that you might have, but I'm not going to go through all of them at this point in time, but I am open for questions. Uh, Mayor Carlson, thank you very much. Um, a couple comments to start. My wife and daughters are big library users, and they've actually utilized the partnership between um, you know, the Lake Agassi Regional Library and Fargo, and tend to cross the river and go to Fargo's new library, uh, and, and quite like it for two reasons, one for the facility, two for the technology they have to do online book ordering. So I'm curious if technology is something that would be included, an upgrade to technology would be included with the new facility. Um, and then secondly, I I'm probably just missed it, but what is the, the tax increase, um, the sales tax increase? Yep, so I'll answer the first one, uh, or the second question first. The, it would be a half cent. Um, local option sales tax, so a half cent. Also, um, right now, the current sales tax in Moorhead is 7.375%. That also includes um, the point, like a half cent county sales tax, and that county sales tax is set to expire in 2027 without an extension. They are actually going to be able to come off uh, their bonding requests for the, the jail um, seven years earlier. Um, so I would fully anticipate that ours would also be able to come up earlier because they raise more money each year than they even anticipated. Um, as far as your first question with technology, 
the current library um, has incorporated some technology, but there's limitations in a building that's 60 years old. And that is something that they're looking at. Uh, one of the ideas that was thrown out was to have a podcast room. Um, so some type of that kind of uh, technology. But also one of the things that the pandemic has uh, created is a lot more individuals that are working from home. But yet, even when you're working from home, people tend to crave, at least more of the extroverts tend to crave, at least being in a room with other people. And so there would be the free Wi-Fi, which is something that they offer right now, but um, Wi-Fi in a community center, maybe a coffee shop, so that people can go and work um, in a setting where there's other people and creating those spaces. Right now, there really aren't those spaces created in our current library. And you have to remember, it's also gonna be a community center too. So um, it might be an area where people that is within a coffee shop that you're able to kind of hang out and work and communicate with other people. Um, with the, the e-books, that's something that the Lake Agassi Regional Library already offers. Um, so you can already download them. So that's not just something that the Fargo Library offers, it's something Moorhead also offers. Um, it, it, it's really expensive because when uh, libraries have to buy the e-books, it's not just a couple dollars like we can as consumers. Um, because it's for a library that is gonna be used over and over and over again, it's a significant uh, price. Um, and I don't remember exactly what it is, and, and Council Member Kroon is on the um, library board. So I'm not sure if you recall what it is for an electronic book, but um, I wanna say it's a couple hundred dollars for one book versus I could buy it for $10. So does that help to answer your question? You know, if I could just add to that real quick. Um, you know, and the library's been talking about it's more than just books. So, you know, you know, you could check out a canoe, you can check out cross-country skis, maybe tools, you could find seeds to plant things in your garden. I mean, just, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, other things, other, you know, library of the future looks much different. And then the mayor had also mentioned a cooperative workspace. So say, you know, uh, you were just going to work. This would be a place where in the morning you could go to work. And so they've talked about it being tied to food and coffee and, and some of the amenities that you would find in a downtown neighborhood. I just wanted to go back to the tax issue too and point out, because you mentioned that there are several items that are exempt and which aren't exempt on the other side of the river. And also that I just wanted to mention too that um, right now uh, our sales tax is lower than in, in Fargo and in West Fargo and it would still be lower even with this if the other, uh, if the other expires that when we add this, we'd still have a lower tax rate on a, on, uh, for our sales tax than they would in Fargo or West Fargo. That's correct. Fargo and West Fargo have a 7.5% sales tax. And like I said, we're at 7.375. Um, with this half cent, it would go slightly above, but with Clay County's being taken off in 2027, it would go back down. And we also don't know what they're gonna be doing um, for sales taxes, uh, local option sales tax on the other side of the river. Um, they don't have to go through as many steps as we do to get that accomplished. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mayor, would you share a little bit more about those subcommittees that are being formed so people know what those options are in case they're interested in getting involved? Yep, absolutely. So there will be four. One will be a communication, so putting together uh, some of the Q&A uh, sheets, uh, the handouts, um, the slide decks to give presentations to some of the local groups in the community like Kiwanis and Rotary and things like that, or, or just citizens who maybe wish to get more information. There's gonna be the communication subcommittee. There is um, a business uh, subcommittee, which James Hand is the chair of that, and I should mention that uh, Council Member Kroon is the chair of the communications subcommittee. Um, James and Carla Wolford are, are co-chairs of the business and really engaging with the business communities to really explain, explain some of the sales tax issues and, and maybe some of the questions that businesses might have um, regarding a local, regional, community, and library center. Um, a third one is community engagement, and that is really doing some of that grassroots movement, going door to door, um, maybe chairing a, a booth at a, the, one of the Red River markets, um, um, such as that kind of community engagement. Um, and then the last one, no, I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. Laura, could you maybe help me or City Manager Molly? Is it a design and programming? 
It's kind of actually working on the programming of the facility. Oh yes, that is that is correct. Yep, um, so taking that information from the citizens engagement um, and really helping to work with JLG, his, who is helping us pro bono um, to really help develop just kind of some basic specs of what this could look like um, to have some of those visuals. I just wanted to say for community engagement, my suggestion would be a pop-up at Dairy Queen or Tasty Freeze in a hot day, and if you need a volunteer to help with that, I'd be happy to be there. <laughs> uh, th thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, for the excellent presentation. I was just curious, as you know, we have the pride of having the DNA of um, a high population of students, high schoolers, middle schoolers as well, at the two universities, and M State, and as well now the Career Academy. I was wondering how are we maybe getting them a little bit involved in that so they have maybe more agency and pride in this coming about, though as well helping us maybe feed that pipeline to then retain them. I'm just thinking out loud here, but if there's any ways of engaging those uh, leaders and then workers of tomorrow, thank you. Yep, we actually do have somebody from Moorhead High School that is on the mayor's task force as well as a college student. Um, both of them are, are Moorhead individuals, so they know a lot of uh, people throughout the community, and we are relying on them um, a lot for input on how do we reach those populations. Um, kind of a, a nice thing is that the college student is actually a communications major, so <laughs> it's really helpful to have her uh, lens not just being from Moorhead, um, and knowing uh, kind of the lay of the land, but also looking at it through the lens of a communications major to figure out how to get all this information to the college students. And then um, our high school student um, is very involved in the high school in, in reaching out to, to those um, future voters. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Mayor Carlson. Yep, stay tuned. I hope to see you all at one of the events in April. And now we'll do the Economic Development Incentive Review with Derek. Thanks, Madam Chair. And and uh, obviously for the purposes of time here, we'll, we'll just, we'll try to summarize a couple things here quickly. So uh, kind of what we're looking at here is we're at a point where we've, we've kind of gone four years with some consistency in our, our programs uh, after making some changes. Um, quality and, and really good due process for economic development is always just double checking, making sure we're doing the right things and aligning with priorities with the city and the council and others. Um, we thought it was a good time to assemble some type of task force, uh, a group that could look at not all of our programs as you kind of see in, um, in the attachment with our economic development incentive index, but um, a few of them that maybe could be expanded upon or as now we have uh, more consistent funding coming in from our border city legislation legislation um, that do we want to look at uh, some of these programs a little bit differently and, and support in different ways. So what we're hoping for is uh, maybe assembling a task force of, of say seven, six or seven individuals. Uh, we're hoping to maybe get three individuals from, from the EDA, um, three individuals from the business slash development community. Uh, so outside of obviously just the, the appointed groups. Um, and if there isn't an elected that comes out of the EDA group, I think having having a council member um, beyond that committee as well. So this would be a group that I think we'd maybe meet a, a couple times over the, um, the next few months, uh, really just kind of understand what we have and, and what we can potentially do. And, uh, and certainly between myself and Amy and, and Dan and others, uh, we might be bringing forward some suggestions for groups, uh, for this group to look at instead of having to come up with brand new programs as well. So um, I don't think we need to do anything with it today. I think what we'll probably end up doing is reaching out to the EDA members and seeing if folks do have an interest in being a part of that. Um, we'd love to, to hear back from you and then uh, with your direction here today or maybe some head nods around the table, uh, we'll start maybe reaching out to a few different business slash development uh, uh, individuals that would be good good participants in that group as well. So, um, and then maybe I'll lean on Dan for the, the council perspective and the mayor about who could be a good fit for that committee as well. Um, that's kind of what that uh, topic was gonna be. I don't know if there's any just general questions that the group has or if that sounds like a good uh, 
thought moving forward, I guess just you can let us know or we can keep moving forward with it too. Okay, I'm seeing some head nods. We'll, we'll follow up with folks after the meeting about kind of that process and if there's a general interest as well. Um, if I can, I'll just maybe go right into my report. Uh, and I, again, I want to be respectful of time here, so I'll probably just only hit on maybe a couple things. Um, as I mentioned, the Moorhead Center Mall stuff is, is coming along nicely. I think we'll, we'll see some, some progress and some opportunities to view that within the next couple of months. Uh, I think mark your calendars if you haven't already for March 24th, the Commissioner of uh, Economic Development and Employment from uh, the state of Minnesota, Steve Grove, is going to be speaking at uh, our local Chamber of Commerce uh, Midwest Economic Outlook Series. I think that's a morning event, I want to say from 8 to about 11. Uh, and I think we're going to have the opportunity to actually uh, get the Commissioner of Deed for a little while as well to have some good one-on-one -on -one conversations about what we're facing here in this area and, and uh, not only how we can expand on this growth within our regional uh, presence, but certainly how we can leverage some things to expand our benefit to the state of Minnesota overall as well. So stay tuned for that and uh, please, if you have time, uh, join that, that event. I think it'll be a good conversation with uh, um, with some good speakers. Uh, with that, I'll maybe leave it open for any questions or, or final comments. Um, uh, yes, I, I just had a, a, a question. Maybe I, I, I missed it, but any, maybe it's too early to say, but any data or findings regarding that Career Academy that kind of opened officially, I don't remember the date. How are things looking? Are we, you know, just curious. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I haven't seen any data yet. Um, uh, I think I maybe mentioned uh, the last time, and I know there was the tour that I wasn't able to meet, uh, make the last month, but um, there is a champions committee that the school district has put together. I do serve on that uh, group as a kind of business connector as well. Um, I may have mentioned this in the previous meeting as well. I think there's more opportunities for partnerships there. Um, I think the school district's trying to balance of, of kind of their internal structure of how they can kind of manage their own system and then try to figure out the best way to approach the external partnerships. But um, from everything I'm hearing and, and heard from some of the students, I think their experience there has been a positive one. And I think it's, I mean, for, for those that have gone through the facility, I think it's just a wonderful facility and what they did in there. So I, again, I think there's more opportunities to build upon that and, and see some successes. Um, uh, and hopefully Brandon and the school district will have uh, some data for us in the, in the next little while. No further questions. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Anything else we need to cover? Nope, I think you can just uh, make the motion to close. <sighs> Meeting adjourned? Yep. Thank you all.